kind of a two-part question. How do you think um, your experiences in the foster care system really prepared you in your career? And then the second one, you seem to have a real strong belief and faith in God. Mm -hmm. How come? It's a lot of things to believe and to really be into here in California and Hollywood. Why that? Um, I know for a fact, okay, in my book I write about the Easter family, which ironically the mother, the foster mother, Elnora Easter, her birthday is today, she, um, they brought me in their home, they taught me, first of all, if anytime you go into a foster home with a parent where the father is a pastor and the mother is the first lady, you're going to church every day. These people, they should go to jail for that, by the way. <laughs> I went to church every day. I mean, Bible study. I learned every book of the Bible. Choir practice. I couldn't sing, but I was singing. Uh, <laughs> prayer service. Uh, Sunday school. Uh, I mean, I mean we, was in, we were in church, but what I loved about church, what I fell in love with church, was gospel music. So, like, gospel music became the ministry that I navigated to. And, yes, he was the best pastor still to this day, and I think T.D. Jakes is the next best, but he was the best. Um, every teaching in the home was about, um, with, of God was just about love. It wasn't like, you know, you got to follow God, because if you don't, you know, people weaponize the Bible, weaponize God. Gays are going to burn it to hell. Well, no, you're going to burn it to hell because the way you slept around on your wife and all these kids you got, but whatever. <laughs> Because even if you lie on your idea about how much you weigh, the Bible says no sin is greater than another. So murder and lying about your weight on that idea, you both are going to hell. <laughs> so um, they were just like really good about teaching me um, God. And then as I started literally like leaning on him, praying, 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 and pray, saying prayer it up. And um, uh, then so that's where I got my faith. And then gospel music led me into like, becoming friends with a lot of gospel artists and Karen Clark Sheard and Yolanda Adams and all these different people. And then like talking to them, they minister to me in a different way than it being all biblical, but it's more teachings of like the lessons that the Bible have or whatever. So I have a strong faith in God. Now I will say this, when I wrote my book, um, the title of the book was gonna be called Waiting to Die because I felt like that every moment of those times, like damn, like I guess I'm just, I'm over this. but. Then I thought about it. I was like, no, nah, I have a strong faith in God, so I'm going to write a book called God Must Have Forgotten About Me to make people think that it's like Serena Williams to this day won't read my book because she thinks it's anti-God. But I keep trying to tell her, read the book because it's not about that. Like, it's it is the not. opposite. It is, yes. So that there's that. Um, what was the second question? That was the second question. The first question was, how did your experiences in foster care oh. prepare you for your survival. career? Survival. Survival. I hear it. Survival. Um, I remember I used to have this um, uh, youth counselor named Johan. Your foster kid never never forgets the good counselors and the bad counselors, or the good foster parents or the bad foster parents. Like you remember everything. Um, but I remember Johan. He every time I would cry or complain about not going home, because my mother would always come and visit me, and then she would leave, and I would be like, "Am I going home?" And she'd be like, "No, I can't take you." So it was like a letdown every time I seen her, and he would say to me. Stop being weak. You're sniveling. Stop being a pussy. This was like grown ass man saying this to like a little ten year old, right? But I remember like um, how I felt about that, and I, I remember like I did toughen up, although I didn't like how he said it. I did have, realize like, yo, I gotta be tough because I can control how I deal with the situation. I can't control the situation. So I look at everything now, like when somebody calls, oh, you know, uh, you're not invited to. Um, the NAACP awards. Okay, cool. So then I call Charlemagne and say, Kai, come in on the Breakfast Club. Then I go on the Breakfast Club and I say, um, the NAACP, oh no, can I tell y'all what I really said? <laughs> <laughs> just understand, it's you just online. said yes. It's online. You just said yes. By the way, if you ask people about me when you meet them or like people that know me, they will never tell you that they met this Jason. They won't say that. This is not really a narrative that people say about me. They were like, yo, he crazy, he wild, he messy, he say this and that. And sometimes they're right. But um, <laughs> uh, I went on the Breakfast Club and I said, fuck the NAACP. Fuck them. Because you can't stand for black excellence and black culture and defending blackness, but then you, you, you segregate the culture on the carpet and put white media before black or hire white publicity firms to manage the culture, to gatekeep the culture, to stop us from coming to having real conversations with the people we talk about every day, but praise the people that talk about them once a month. Fuck you, fuck your publicity firm. I mean, I went all the way out. And it became a thing where then, all the black journalists started rallying up behind me, 
calling out people on the red carpet and Halle Berry stopped for a black outlet when her white publicist tried to stop her and then that went viral and people still today, just the Essence editor talked about it on The Breakfast Club crediting the movement that I started, but it wasn't a movement that I wanted to start. I just wanted to address something head on, loud enough for everybody to hear it, knowing that what, you're not gonna invite me to your award show, guess what, I already got my own award show. So I don't gotta go. So my team the other day said, can we submit you for NAACP or what I said, for fun. <laughs> They're not gonna <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> but like you can submit it for fun, like send them a picture of me going, hey, you know. But um, I don't really care, like, you know, I know now like I do want an Emmy at some point because I know that I'll be able to stand on a stage to say a message to people who believe they would never be able to get there. Like it's just, everything I'm doing now is just to get to a place to say like, yo, I'm nationally syndicated in 72 markets on iHeart. I'm the first openly gay host in urban radio to do that. So that door has been open now. Okay, while and out, all my jokes, Nick Cannon, are going to be gay. I'm going to kiss somebody on your show. I'm going to be gay every time I come up here because there's somebody gay at home that's never seen a gay joke on while and out saying, damn, now they got this gay nigga up there kissing people. Sorry, I said nigga, but that's how I talk. <laughs> um, and, I warned them. Uh, huh? I warned them. Edit out. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, like, I just now, like, I don't know. I had a conversation the other day with this brand. I'm not gonna say the brand because you're filming this, but this man uh, was very, um, he was bothered by the fact that he had to talk to me because he's the number two person at this major, major, major brand. And uh, his boss told him to get on the call with me, but he felt like he was, ab I felt like he felt like he was above me because he didn't know who I was. He was like, why are we on the call? Like, you know, I get so many calls every day. Like, what, what, what you know? And that's what he said to me. And I just said, to, and in my mind, I, I kept saying like, we really, this is a multi-million dollar opportunity. Jason, like, don't let yourself down. Come on. I said, okay. First of all, you're not even the right partner for me because I could tell by your attitude that you think you're better than me, but I can look at you and tell you that you're not. I said, the second thing is, you talk about this culture, the culture. Can you tell me what is the culture? Because I've been living it for 46 years and you've been hired to push it for two. I'm not going to waste any more of my time, but yet I'm going to go out and talk about this experience. And I promise you, you better beat me. You better beat me to your board of directors and your upline because they're going to hear it. And he calmed himself down and he said, okay, 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 okay. okay. <laughs> hey. So we had this whole moment, this whole conversation. And, but here's the deal. Like I said at the top, I always stay ready. He calmed me down. He said, we're going to set up another call. We're going to figure this out. We're going to do this, this, and that. I'm not really sure we could do it, but we'll figure it out. So that, not sure what we're going to do, I knew it was his way out. The next call, there were three black people on the call with him, and he put them all in front of him to talk to me. And I said, and I let them do their best, and, I, and right when I said, are you guys done? I said, let me give you guys a lesson. Mm -hmm. um, back in slavery days, there was a plantation where the house niggas came and handled the rest of us, and that's what you just tried to do. Now, when I tell you, baby, the commitments they're giving me, the conversations, <laughs> the, oh my God, no, now, they're like, would you come in as a culture consultant? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But that's the thing, right? You can't be afraid to lose what you don't got. So I went in already not having it, but knowing the value that I would have coming to it. So like when he was telling me how too busy he was, I said, you know what? You'd want a partnership with Jay Balvin, Rihanna, Queen Latifah, Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've worked with some of them. I said, I'm gonna put them all in a group text and you right now and tell them exactly what you did to me. Because you're, you wouldn't talk to them that way because you see the perceived value is what's on the outside. You didn't even give me a chance. But my whole life has been people not giving me a chance. And I'm still gonna steamroll right over your ass. And now, now the people who, now it's like a whole thing. Now everybody's just, uh, you know, they're really sensitive about the relationship. But like I tell them, I'm only going to be, um, I'm only going to be the, vessel of truth. So whatever the experience is, if it's great, it's going to be great. If it ain't, it's not going to be great. And if I don't get to partner with you, it's your loss. Good. <laughs>